Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming this morning. Um, I want to introduce Dr. Jeff Wilson. I think all of you know him. Um, he is getting ready to finish up our series, our wellness arthritis series. This is the fourth series, Urgent Emergent Rheumatology. Um, so let's give him a warm Westminster Canterbury welcome. Thank you. Everyone can hear way back and back. Wanted to start off just a review of the, of the series, some of the things we've done. First of all, August 18th, we wanted to, to just talk about the different features, different types of arthritis. And when you are having problems, it may be a combination of these things. Maybe some inflammatory arthritis, someone has rheumatoid, may have some osteoarthritis, wear and tear type arthritis or mechanical problems. And you always wonder, are there any metabolic disorders going on that may be affecting presentation of the arthritis, the progression of the arthritis, particularly thyroid type disease, systemic diseases, underlying diseases, are we seeing some manifestations of aches and pains that may be from underlying tumors, always concerned about that. Infectious or infectoid type problems, things like uh, that, how COVID can cause so many arthralgias, aches and pains, and then uh, fibromyalgia and basic straight pain type disorders. We're getting some clues about that with COVID with people with a long haulers disease. August 25th, we took a look at rheumatoid, which is really sort of the poster child of rheumatology. Most important thing about that is what we know about inflammation and how inflammation is what destroys joints, but also is the thing that is so terrible with the COVID patients. It's when they get into maybe the initial part of the disease when antiviral agents might work, but not those anti-worm medicines. Don't that stuff you hear about Invectum, forget that. Uh, but antiviral medicines early on, and then after that, when once the system gets going with the immune system, the inflammatory system, that's the thing that can cause a lot of morbidity and mortality. So we talked about that. We mentioned alternative and complementary therapies, herbs and so on. Kumar told us about the magnet therapy and all other things that may be used and useful in arthritis. Then uh, last time, September 2nd, talking about lupus, and lupus particularly because that's the uh, disease that's sort of the poster child for autoimmune diseases, which are increasing like crazy and, uh, and everyone thinks if we live long enough that we'll all have positive ANAs, anti-nuclear antibodies, develop these antibodies. And it's a combination of what we've inherited, you know, our genetics that make us susceptible, and then things that trigger off the susceptibility. And we remember that the, the environment and environmental triggers with global warming, increasing ranges and numbers of ticks, exposure, all these things are, are you know, causing more and more uh, illnesses and disease. So I just wanted to kind of review the things we looked at. The um, large vessel vasculitis, we're going to be talking about giant cell arteritis and temporal arteritis. And looking back, uh, my first experience with temporal arteritis actually was before I was a rheumatologist. I was in training, the senior residency program. You go around different subspecialties. And I intentionally avoided rheumatology as a subspecialty because I was going to do that for two years. And I got a consult. And I was the gastroenterology uh, senior resident and they wanted us to do a liver biopsy on a patient who was having unknown fevers and a fever of unknown origin and, and sed rate, elevated sed rate of unknown origin, sed rate being a sign of inflammation. And we reviewed, reviewed the notes and we loved to do procedures. I, I would love to do liver biopsies all day. Uh, you know, that's just the way we are. And so I was happy to do that, but I just read a great article in the American Journal of Medicine about the temporal arteritis presenting as a fever of unknown origin or sed rate of unknown origin. This patient had been in the hospital for about three weeks. Can't tell you how many gallons of blood they had drawn out of her due for every study, blood cultures and so on. Nothing showed up. We did a liver, they wanted a liver biopsy for a culture to see if some unusual presentation of TB, some unusual liver disease. I saw the note and I, and I said that, yeah, we'll do a liver, glad to do a liver biopsy. But think about a temporal artery biopsy because she could have, and at that time I didn't even know the name. I said, temporalis arthritis. Temporal arteritis, I didn't know, but I knew something was funny about that. The typical thing in learning at Duke is the resident for the ward questions everything as far as consultations. The patient's too young, this is a typical presentation, those nest tests aren't necessary. You really had to convince them things to do. So I got this uh, one resident called uh, Dr. Shipley, and he pointed out the reasons why it couldn't be, you know, temporal arteritis. And I said, okay, well, after they did the liver biopsy, and the liver biopsy was negative, they did a temporal artery biopsy. And guess what? The lady had temporal arteritis, giant cell arteritis. So that sort of put me 
you know, a, a little bit with having a little more credence with Dr. Shipley as the resident. The, um, later on, I've run into to Mike about two years later when he is the fellow on, on uh, gastroenterology and I'm the rheumatology fellow. We had a patient admitted with a very unusual disease, all kinds of arthralgias, aches and pains, weight loss, fever, arthritis, rheumatoid factors positive. And the, the patient, uh, yeah, when they admitted the patient, I thought this sounds like a thing called Whipple's disease. During the, the discussion with the patient, the history, I said, was there ever any time that you felt better? He said, well, yeah, there was one week, I, my doctor put me on tetracycline, you know, for bronchitis, and I felt better. My appetite came back, I was doing better. I thought, well, bingo, that's a sign maybe of Whipple's, a bacterial infection of the GI tract that can present this way. <clears throat> so I said, to diagnose it, we need uh, a small bowel biopsy, which I had to have the okay by the gastroenterology fellow, which is Dr. Shipley. So he comes in and sees and he writes all this letter about why it can't possibly be Whipple's. <laughs> he should have known, shouldn't he? Because sure enough, they did the biopsy and it was Whipple's. Very unusual condition. So after that, I think he always believed me when, when things came up. The uh, polymyalgia rheumatic, uh, we've mentioned before, uh, that it can be a disease of very sudden onset, almost overnight. Someone say, I woke up, felt like I was 100 years old. It also usually responds very nicely to low dose prednisone, five milligrams twice a day. And then two weeks later, they come in and they say, gee, I feel you know, much, much better, you know, great medicine. And then over the next 18 months to two years, go ahead and consolidate the prednisone, taper down, taper off the medicine by one milligram decrements, usually going away in 18 months to two years. But it's a diagnosis of exclusion, like so many of these things, and you have to make sure there's no underlying tumors going on. Uh, and one of the, my patients that I had, who had a, a nice gentleman who came in, the board. when he came in for his follow-up, he was doing better, just like he should with PMR, but he was angry because Medicare didn't want to pay for his PSA test they ordered for his prostate. And uh, why did you order that? They, if they didn't want to pay for it, you shouldn't have done it. Mm, that's not the right philosophy, I don't think. But anyway, uh, his, uh, his PSA should have been like you know, less than 30, and it was like 800. He had prostate cancer. So he had both. Now, if, he had, if I had not done the test, then we would have picked it up maybe much, much later. That would not have been, been helpful to him. But, the, but also, he responded just like a PMR would. So I think so you can have PMR in the face of, of cancer that may respond like, like a polymyalgia rheumatic alone. Always worry about underlying cancers as, as a, a diagnosis of exclusion. PMR is in a spectrum with temporal arteritis. And years ago, Ted Harris was wonderful at that time, wonderful young uh, academic rheumatologist, uh, now deceased. But he, he found that if you had patients with PMR who for other reasons passed away, and they did an autopsy, over 30% of them, you could find evidence of, of temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis, vasculitis, inflammation of the blood vessels. So he thought, well, that's interesting, isn't it? Sort of a, you know, a, a spectrum, just like some of the uh, autoimmune diseases. So with that in mind, the uh, next time that, uh, that that sort of came up um, in polymyalgia rheumatica, my, my mother and and my aunt, Aunt Virginia, called her Aunt Skinny, lived in Parkersburg, West Virginia, both of them widowed. And, and Skinny, I had sort of talked her through, there were no rheumatologists in Parkersburg, but PMR. And over about a year and a half to two years, she'd come down on her prednisone, doing, doing real well. So on just a routine follow-up call to, to mom, I said, well, how's Skinny doing? Not good. She's gonna have an MRI tomorrow morning, she's having these terrible headaches. Now, all the way for, for a year and a half or two years, whenever I went to see Skinny, I'd say, Skinny, any headaches, scalp tenderness, pain in your mouth, chewing your food, temporary loss of vision, any of that going on? No, 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 nothing. So here this thing was starting, and I said, Skinny, get mom, get Skinny on the line. Skinny, headaches, yeah. Tender areas on the scalp, yeah, pain in your mouth, chewing. She had everything, and she didn't remember me asking that for a year and a half. I said, well, tell your doctor, instead of doing the MRI, do the sedimentation rate, $8 sedimentation rate. And then we did that, and then you got a temporal artery biopsy. She had temporal arteritis. So you can go from PMR, you can look like it's, it's, it's uh, resolved completely, and then develop temporal arteritis later on. And it runs in families. So, you know, worth knowing there as well. Uh, one of my, my patients said, uh, when I came to saw him, he said, you know, your father took care of my mother. 
the temporal arthritis. Well, when my father was me years before, I thought either I look good now or, or looked old then. And the things I want you to always remember now about, about, the, uh, about this is as far as urgent problems, when you develop a present with PMR, it's sort of urgent. You want to get on prednisone, makes a big difference. But if you're having the headache, scalp tenderness, all this, plus temporary loss of vision, like amaurosis, fugax, coming or going vision, then that's the emergency. That's got to be taken care of right away. That, that's on the way to the emergency room, maybe to the hospital, somewhere getting IV steroids to prevent stroke and blindness. And we've seen that several times. Once it occurs, once the blindness occurs, almost never uh, can, you, can you reverse that. And in general, if ever, any, at any time you have a headache, you say, boy, this is the worst headache I've ever had. Never had anything like this before. You go into the emergency room because you know, things like aneurysms burst, and, and those are those, and or like temporal arthritis can occur. Interesting thing about temporal arthritis and PMR is they, they response very very quickly to steroids. The first patient, as a, as a uh, rheumatology fellow that we saw that we wrote up, um, and whenever he had patients that were kind of interesting cases, they say this is a reportable case. That was a big thing. You wanted to report cases. And we had a patient named Sally Wilson, no relation. Uh, and she presented yeah, as, a, as about a you know, 78-year-old black female. At that time, they felt like giant cell arthritis did not occur in blacks, thought the gout did not occur in blacks, spondyloarthropathies did not occur in blacks. And the other day in JAMA, there was an article saying, guess what? Cystic fibrosis, they thought didn't occur in blacks, does as well. So we were, we were learning things. And that was the first... Uh, first paper that I published with some other physicians at that time. And literally, she came in and called that afternoon, and she got in her prednisone, and uh, the headache was starting to lift immediately. So steroid sensitive, very, very nice. My Aunt Skinny, however, since she's dealing with family members, and I got her on the phone and said, Skinny, do you have any of that prednisone left? She said, yeah, I've got about you know 20 of those one milligram tablets. I said, well, take them all at once. You've never had me take that much prednisone. And she said, I knew you were crazy, and now I'm sure of it. I said, well, I said, you know, go ahead and flatter me or, you know, uh, and take them. So she did, and, and then got on the regimen over the next year and a half or so on, go to her finish with her temporal arthritis. That resolved as well. So lots of lessons that we learned. My front office uh, lab gal, D. D. Templeton, Gresham, um, smartest person ever worked at Lynchburg Rheumatology, including the doctors. And he said, you know, you never forget anything about your patients. I do, but I remember a lot of things too. Uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting later on to find out how things have, have gone. Um, at church, we have a prayer chain. And looking through the request was a girl whose mother was here at Westminster Canterbury. And she said, mom's having these headaches. Jeez, I said, so you go back and got in touch with her. I said, you know, Joan, find out. You know, she's having, you know, headaches, headaches visual tenderness, tenderness in the scalp, pain in her mouth, chewing her food. She had all of that. And indeed, she had temporal arthritis. So we were able to, that was almost sort of early telemedicine, wasn't it? Just going to catch them through the prayer chain. Very nice. Uh, and we talked last time also about pulseless disease, where some of these people may present with, uh, with unable to detect pulses or blood pressure. They're still alive, uh, but it scares the nurses to death. And, and that's something that can resolve in, in, temp in treating for the temporal arthritis. That's part of the inflammation of the larger part of the blood vessels. We thought, we thought for a long time that the temporal artery right here was put there just for us to biopsy so we can make these diagnoses. Um, then it's always, always interesting when you uh, run into some, some other memorable cases. And I had a patient that was admitted, a uh, nice elderly lady, patient of Charlie Sackett's, to the hospital. And she was admitted because she had an interesting history. She had seen Harold Riley. She'd seen uh, such good physicians, of sinu uh, ENT doctors for sinusitis. But Harold said, I really think she's got temporal arthritis and started on pro appropriate doses of prednisone, milligram per kilogram, 20 milligrams twice a day in her case. She went crazy. And there's a thing called steroid psychosis. It's very much uh, related to the uh, dose of steroids that you take. And so she had gone completely crazy, so Harold stopped the prednisone. 
then, then a smart thing is to refer to Charlie. Charlie took a look at her, and he started back on prednisone. She went crazy. He admits her to the hospital, so the psychiatrist can give her some psychotropic medicines, and then asked me to see her in consultation. And, and, and seeing her and talking to the family, she had everything. She had the 10 minutes in the, in the scalp to touch. Pain in the mouth chewing the food is like a stress test. The blood vessels are thickened, and so the, the supply of blood is sort of fixed. So you start exercising the muscles chewing, basically you're having angina, chewing claudication, very classic for temporal arteritis. So she had that. She had temporary loss of vision, and, and it's a miracle she hadn't lost her vision. So I saw her and I was hoping somehow maybe her temporal artery biopsy would be negative, but it was very positive. What do you do? Um, treat her, does she go crazy? Can, can you glue her head together, as we say, with various medicines? Uh, and rheumatology is a small group. We had, like, at that time, maybe 3,000, 4,000 rheumatologists and 40,000 cardiologists, who all apparently are 12 years of age. If you run into cardiologists, they all look so young. <laughs> but we're a small group. We see each other at meetings. Uh, so at that time, the person who was sort of the, the main man in temporal arteritis in the country was Gene Hunter, Mayo Clinic. So I called him. I said, Dr. Hunter, I said, I've got this patient, has steroid psychosis. She has a positive biopsy for temporal arteritis, what do I do? He said, I, I don't know, but let me know what, how she turns out. <laughs> said, I said, hoping for a little more definitive help. Called John Davis, who's magnificent at uh, UVA, head of, of rheumatology there. I said, same thing to John. John, what do I do? He said, I don't know, I haven't seen that. Let me know what you do. <laughs> so, what did we do? Well, knowing the PMR, you know, is a spectrum leading on to temporal arteritis, I thought, well, the best we can do this is steroid psychosis, is, steroid is dosage re related. Let's start as low dose, try to keep her head together, and that maybe she'll respond to. And indeed, she responded to like 10 milligrams twice a day instead of 20 milligrams twice a day. Then we were able to taper her down over some time uh, and take care of that problem. So unusual things, every patient you know, has, has their own story, uh, but that, that was some of ours from PMR and temporal arteritis. PMR and temporal arteritis were favorite diseases of mine to take care of because they usually did very, very well. The next page we're going to talk about, and one way to look at vasculitis, again, which is inflammation of blood vessels, large vessel vasculitis, temporal arteritis, giant cell arteritis, always older patients, you know, uh, certainly, you know, fit above 50. But you'd have a similar, similar biopsy finding of vasculitis in young people called pulseless disease, Takayasu's disease. Um, and it ends up that, that the, uh, they also respond you know, well to the steroids. So the next group are medium vessel vasculitis problems. And for some times we knew the hepatitis B, which was very much uh, active and rampant uh, early on in, in my career in tra training in med school time. 68 to 72, we still found out the people that had this, inf this uh, infection later on developed polyarteritis nodosa, medium vessel vasculitis, often presenting with kidney fit problems, protein in the kidneys, uh, in the urine, and, new, uh, and uncontrollable blood pressure, responsive to cytoxan and medicines along those lines. The next big group of medium vessel vasculitides were called ANCA associated. ANCA is an anti neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody just another one of those antibodies. But it gave you, gave you a clue that if they had that, and if they had problems where they're presenting often with sinusitis, cystic changes in the lungs, and involvement of the, of the kidneys, pulmonary renal type presentation, that we thought about Wagner's granulomatosis, uh, they've changed the name to a granulomatous polyangiitis, um, they responded nicely to cytoxan, and I would see one or two of those folks a year then uh, the, the ANCA test came in a, called a C ANCA and a P ANCA. And the P ANCA may be seen in patients who had asthma after long term asthma, allergy, develop on into a, you know, a vasculitis called Churg Strauss vasculitis. It's an eosinophilic, non granulomatous vasculitis. So all these things sort of gave you clues to, to the, the presentation and the more specific treatment. With these disorders, they often required you to. Uh, be on, on strong medicines for a long while. Cytoxan frequently, rituxan became very popular, thing called Celsef, mycophenolate, very powerful medicines, but the patients could do quite well. 
one of my first patients I saw that was from here with vasculitis, nice fellow, been a prior mayor at uh, Lynchburg in the past, and the outcome at, at that time, we were just getting started with these things, and he remembered because when I met with him, I said, you know, you may not do well with this, to say the least, did beautifully once we got it under control. Well, vasculitis is, is, is hard enough by itself, but they have the conditions that mimic a vasculitis. And one of them was a thing called atrial myxoma, the only main, most common primary tumor of the heart. And the, at that time, Duke was sending us out as fellows to Fayetteville to uh, do consultations in an AHEC. Didn't have, didn't have a rheumatologist available there. Loved to do it because you went down there you're kind of like a real doctor, you know. You didn't, you weren't presenting to, you know, senior attending. You know, you just made the, the mind up what to do and took care of it. Fascinating cases. And uh, Fayetteville had a wonderful female physician named Lynn Johnson, uh, single, never married, uh, and she would present these great cases to me. And at the end of it, it'd be com complex, perplexing cases. She'd say, "You fix, okay?" <laughs> I said, oh, "I'll try, Dr. Johnson. Tremendous lady." We, we would have gone and, and uh, set up practice in, in Fayetteville, except for a couple of things, Sandra being one of the main ones. <laughs> At that time, she was from North Carolina. It was referred to as Vietnam. Remember that? And, uh, but I love the doctors down there. had a great time. And the final thing, we were going down being recruited by a uh, very nice gastroenterology guy and uh, one of the pulmonary doctors and renal doctors from Duke likewise wanted us to come down there. As we pulled in, we decided it was raining like crazy, and we're going to stop uh, and get some, some chicken at, the, at uh, uh, Colonel Sanders. As we pulled in, in the window there, there was uh, this uh, fellow dressed up like Colonel Sanders. And uh, I thought, well, that's a neat kind of you know, advertising thing to do to stimulate business. So sent Sandra in. At that time, we had our dog Muffet with us. And sent Sandra in. She came back out. And I said, well, is that some sort of publicity thing? She said, no. That's a local nut that dresses up like Colonel Sanders, you know, and just comes in and sits here for hours and hours. And uh, so it sort of soured us on, on Fayetteville, thanks to Sandra. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, one of the complications of that can be dreadful vasculitis as a complication. Again, once the infection gets going, some people's immune system, just like COVID is showing us, is going to, to respond and, and act against the, the individual. Fascinating thing was, was cholesterol emboli. We're doing so much in the way of catheterization, obviously with, uh, with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease. Sometimes, particularly if they're going through the groin for uh, putting up catheters, they'll be knocking off some bits of cholesterol. <clears throat> they go out into the uh, extremities and the fingers and hands can show up as little purple changes of cholesterol emboli. And sometimes you have to do biopsies to, to show that they're present. Um, so those are, more, those are some of the more common things. Hepatitis C, much more common problem uh, in the last few years, can have about two or three forms of vasculitis with it. <laughs> and had a, uh, a, a grand patient with that uh, who was a tournament bass fisherman. So we had an exchange, got him some information, take, took care of his hepatitis C related uh, arthritis, and I got some t fishing tips Love that. That was one of my, my better patients. Memorable. This is what I did to get ready for this talk this weekend. Anybody had gout? Pseudo gout? You remember it, okay. Gout or gouch. And these, again, urgent and in, 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 in the emergent problems. <coughs> if you have it, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> If you have, <clears throat> have it, it will get your attention. Classic, the classic history is went to bed and woke up in the middle of the night, you know, with his red swollen so, toe <clears throat> so tender that she couldn't stand the sheet to touch it. That's pretty tender. And that's, uh, that's a cute gal. And it's from a deposition of a crystal, monosodium urate crystal. And when you've had a cute gal, the treatment is very different than in between or chronic treatment of gout. And to control it, <clears throat> they used to say, to the medicine called colchicine. You take one colchicine every hour, 
and about the fifth or sixth hour, you were so nauseated that you either didn't care about the pain or you actually started to get better. Uh, and then a strange thing happened to colchicine. The FDA <clears throat> realized that colchicine had been used for 50 years so effectively for gout, had not gone through the hoops and tests and so on for them to give it their blessing. And so they said, you know, someone has to, to, do, to go through the various steps on, on it. One company did it and found out nothing new that we didn't know about colchicine, but they got the uh, rights for the patent for the medicine. And the colchicine uh, went from a like eight tenths of a cent you know, per pill to like five dollars per pill. So you know, took, they took away you know, the competition, and that those people had a their own monopoly on that. When that occurred, so many of our patients automatically did the same thing: if you take care of the acute gout or flare-ups, they would just use low-dose prednisone, so much cheaper. The thing I worried about is that all of a sudden the FDA is going to say, you know, no one ever looked at prednisone and made it go jump through these hoops. That would be you know, dreadful as far as controlling inflammation and problems. They didn't make that medicine five or six bucks a pill. So acute gout tends to run in the families. Um, and after you get the acute gout under control, when, as a rheumatologist, often the, the patients would be treated with indocin. Um, and usually it's often older patients that have gout. Indocin is a good medicine short half-life, works quickly, uh, but it can, real, it can be real tough on the stomach, cause a lot of ulcers. Um, so sometimes you might try to avoid that with acute gout and maybe control with the colchicine two, just one twice a day. Maybe use some Tylenol with it. Sometimes use a shot of steroids like Depomedrol or go all over, or even a steroid taper. And that would control the acute gout, but if the primary doctor started off and the patient was not controlled with the endocin, uh, or maybe some, some other medicines where the prednisone or the shot, he said, well, we'll add allopurinol. And when I knew that occurred, I was going to see the patient because the acute gout patient who's never been on allopurinol, when that's added to it, it, it just causes a, a diffuse release of the, of the crystal stuff. He, the patient will be much, much worse. He's going to have a much greater flare, extended uh, problem with the acute gout. So I knew then we were going to see him. What about the diagnosis of gout? You hear people talking about the uric acid with well, the uric acid's elevated, and the, that, is no, that does not diagnose gout. Uric acid can be elevated for many, many different reasons. A lot of times you can have acute gout even with a normal uric acid. Diagnosis of gout depends on uh, doing a crystal examination, and we'll see a picture of that uh, later on under a polarizing microscope uh, that of a specific crystal, very needle-shaped like crystal. You can imagine the joint, this thing causing a lot of discomfort. So acute gout, once you get under control, we usually did with the colchicine twice a day, maybe a non steroidal anti-inflammatory or low-dose prednisone. Then as it's resolving, then you add in your allopurinol very slowly. You might add in a usual dose, maybe 300 milligrams a day. You start off with maybe 50 milligrams a day for a week or two, go up to 100 milligrams a day, up to 200, and slowly gradually build it up as you taper off the prednisone. And that usually takes care of the inner critical time of gout. Chronically, you do want to get the uric acid down. You want the uric acid below about six, and allopurinol can do that. Wonderful medicine that came out, Febuxostat, called Euloric, for patients to have renal problems. And often, uh, renal problems just accompany gout problems. You know, the patients are older and their kidneys may not be less tolerant to allopurinol. Allopurinol is a medicine that uh, it can cause some bad skin reactions. And they now have some tests maybe to, to look at ahead of time to try to avoid that. <coughs> Knock on wood, I never had that. <coughs> but gout also, anybody know of any kind of um, over-the-counter or, or, or special remedies for gout that you heard of? It can be, that can be one of the causes. <clears throat> Good point. When we were asking, going through the history, we were asking if uh, anybody in the family has had gout or kidney stones, because they are related. And uh, they found out that if patients who are over-excreters of uric acid take a look at a urinary uric acid, if they're over-excreters, their chances of developing a kidney stone, if they haven't had it, are terrific. If you do treat them and get the uric acid down in the blood, often that will protect against future kidney stones. 
Pope did in his case. Did he get on that? that yeah the diet the diet for for gout you're very restrictive the uh, the richest patient I ever took care of great guy you know would, uh, his driver bought him up you know in his limo for his appointments I was very prestigious you know and I said ooh Dr. Wilson's got that kind of patient and uh, however he loved the rich life tell him to give up chocolates tell him not to have hot dogs on you know fourth of July you know, or, or rich meats and lots of alcohol, you know, for celebration. He celebrated frequently. And I knew that, you know, I might as well go ahead and, and set up an, an appointment for him to see me, you know, uh, you know, about a week or so after Labor Day, I mean, any, any holiday, New Year's, anything. And so sure enough, he called having a flare. And I'd, I'd go over the, over the diet with him. You know, you've got to avoid this, avoid that, and so on. Uh, it would really be best for you if you didn't drink any alcohol. And really, the best thing you can do is, is this. And he said, you know, after after doing this, and after going through several years of every holiday, seeing him back for a shot of Depot Medrol or injection in the joint, he said, you know, Dr. Wilson, I've abused my body for so long. I don't deserve what's best. What would be second best? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, see that in the bottom of the sheet there? Yeah. yeah the, uh, you know, I remember the first time the lady came in and told me about that, and, and you know, often, as you know, the women have to bring the husbands in for care. And the husband came in, oh, he had horrible gout. And if you take a look at the picture of the hands on down there about two pages later, see that how the hair tube with that hand, those hands look? That's all gout. And, you know, the patient's comment was, well, thank goodness I don't have the crippling arthritis. <laughs> Could it be any more crippling? The interesting thing about this crippling arthritis is that with the treatment and, and allopurinol over time, these things will resolve. They're all great big deposits of gout, uh, uric acid, tophaceous deposits, we call them. And you can see changes in the, uh, uh, on x-rays where, the, where it's look like big, great big bites taken out of the bone, and those will heal in. The only type of arthritis that does that. Very, very you know, nice to see that, that respond. But anyway, he came in, and mom was taking care of him, and she says, Tell them about cherries for, for his gout. Tell them about cherries for gout. Tell them about cherries for gout. And I'm trying to get the history and go over some stuff. <clears throat> Came so close to telling her that it was an old wives' tale and that she was an old wife. But I'd learned a few years before to swallow your smoke. <laughs> and um, that occurred in the emergency room at Duke one time when, as a resident, I always uh, had things that, that were my pet peeve. If on the board there was listed patient with weak and disease, patient with weak and disease, and I felt like I did not want my interns to have to work on these folks, because usually it was nothing, and I would go in and take care of them, get them on their way. And I did not want any of the family back in the rooms with the patients. I, I wanted to see the patients ourselves, get them taken care of. <clears throat> so anyway, this 54-year-old uh, weak and dizzy was back there. Well, my policy was, again, no, no family back there. I heard this lady up front with, with the nurses raising cane. That time I get back with my husband, but my husband back with my husband. So I thought, well, I'll go ahead and defend my, my nurses and staff up there. I said, look, I said, it's my, my policy. I'm in charge of the emergency room here as the resident. Um, and now a tactical thing. If you don't like it, here's a map to Carolina. You can go to their emergency room. This is really nice. Great bedside manner. <laughs> and, um, and so, um, I went back to see the patient. She went back, sat down, grumbling, grumbling. And I said, I, I said, you've had your patient for 50 years. You've had your husband for 50 years. I want him for 20 minutes to figure out what's going wrong. Her response, how old do you think I am? Oh, I knew I was in trouble. I said, well, well, whatever. She went and sat down. Went back, nicest guy in the world. Nicest assistant professor in our religion department. And I said, I, said, I may have upset your wife a little. He said, well, she's a little upsettable. He had, he had fainted, just dead away fainted in talking to some of his graduate students had just come back from Africa, had some harrowing experiences with some of the tribes there. So it was a common vasobagal reaction. He said, well, I hope she didn't bother our neighbor about it. Oh, who's your neighbor? Oh, Jim Weingard, the chairman of the Department of Medicine, my boss, my ultimate boss, who I was depending the next week to finish my residency training and have him sign my diploma. And I thought, you know, 
I'm going to be repeating this residency or something's <laughs> going to happen. Swallow your smoke. So anyway, this lady's case, and I, and I didn't, I said, I said, well, well, we'll go over diet and stuff and treatment. And so I didn't say anything about that, like old, old lady and old lady's ID and so on. And that's so smart. Two weeks later, as often happens, how comes that arthritis and rheumatism, our main journal, has this great article on cherries and gout? <laughs> and no doubt about it, in some people, it really makes a nice, nice difference. And it's not dangerous to try, so I think that's, that's fine and dandy. <clears throat> so the gouty hands, you've seen a picture of the gouty hands, and you can imagine how poorly they function. And so nice, unbelievably nice to see how you can, you can reverse that. The next page shows two things. And one is the, the yellow crystals that you see that look like little needles. And it's just a great sign. And that's what we call it. A, they looked, they're looked at under polarized light. It's a red condenser. And, and it shows they light up a certain way. And the yellow th th uh, crystals are monosodium urate. We say yellow parallel to the red condenser and allopurinol. So we think of all things together being related to gout. And the ones that are blue are you know, perpendicular to that. OK, so yellow is parallel to the red condenser. Well, look up on the, on the upper, upper hand of the others. These are CPPD from pseudogout crystals. Pseudogout crystals are rhomboid shape. They're not needle shape. And, and uh, they have what we call the opposite birefringence. They'll actually be kind of blue when they're oriented in the axis uh, with, uh, with the gouty crystals. On rare occasion, you'll have some poor soul who has both of them. That can be very uncomfortable and painful. The next picture just shows you the podagra that occurs uh, as a classic you know, gouty toe. You remember the pictures uh, in the old newspapers of, of Jeeves or the old rich man with his toe up on the, you know, so forth, up on the ottoman, and he's got his, you know, foot wrapped and so on. Terrible, terrible pain. And that's gout. Pseudogout, pseudogout, chondrocalcinosis. Very interesting. And that's something that's very likely to occur at times, just like gout. And sometimes it will occur in unusual places, like that distal joint. We talked about the DIP joint. And it can be just as red and, and tender. It can occur. It can be all over the body. And I was called one night, and a man who had uh, the, the calcium chondrocalcinosis all over the body, he was just as sick as any gout patient or lupus patient or terrible rheumatoid. Had to treat him with steroids and so on to cool him down. And when you get that, it can be an acute, it can be chronic, it can be familial as well. And you can find underlying conditions like parathyroid, hyperparathyroidism, Hand the problems handling the phosphate, magnesium problems, thyroid problems, all these things related. So you always look at all these different things that may be associated with uh, pseudo gout, take care of those and improve the, improve the gout, take care of the underlying disease. Meanwhile, you treat it the same way as you did gout, really, with low dose colchicine, often chronically, <coughs> maybe low dose steroids or non steroidal anti inflammatory me medicines. <coughs> these agents really accelerate the wear and tear of your joints. And when, you're, when your doctor finds you know, you're standing with your knee joints and knees are hurting, you see this little line of calcium in the cartilage, not a good sign. It's going to wear down that cartilage faster. So you try to calm down episodes of inflammation with the chondrocalcinosis as best you can with those various medicines. The, um, So no one's had any pseudogout either. Knock on wood. I hope you won't get it. I want to mention a couple of things and then just open up for questions and, and tell you about some of these things that are on the table here. Cancer immunotherapy, more and more uh, of importance and interest. And you know the idea is that you, you're at the different areas called checkpoints. Your system has inhibitors that are inhibiting your immune system from reacting against cancers. We think maybe the Maybe we're all forming cancer cells all the time, or abnormal cells. The immune system uh, does surveillance and takes those out of the system. Very nice. I think vitamin D helps to do that. Um, but when it doesn't, and it's not, it's not taking care of it, these, they think they, they, it's inhibited these different checkpoints. So if you use a medicine, cancer immunotherapy goes and inhibits uh, the inhibitor checkpoint. And when it does that, it increases anti-tumor immunity. So the immune system is now able to act more as an anti-tumor, anti-cancer agent. 
that's great, but also it's released the immune system. And we've already found out with the COVID, when you release the immune system, sometimes there are other problems. These people develop all kinds of inflammatory arthritis problems, you know, pneumonitis, arthritis, uh, problems with uh, hepatitis, all kinds of diarrhea, colitis, every kind of itis you can think of, and often has to be treated with prednisone and steroids. Well worth it if you're responding you know, to immunotherapy, but it can be quite a problem. Denise knows what these are. Anyone knows what these are? These are called peripheral brains. And this peripheral brain started in 1968. And here's uh, this uh, student's Duke post office box number 2882. And as we went through here, when things came up, it started to record, and we went ahead and wrote things down about how, about how to handle alcohol, delirium tremens. I'd see a, a resident or an intern, I thought it was really a sharp intern, and I'd kind of watch and see what he did. So I wrote that down. And so two years later, when I'm, it's my day in the barrel, I had these things ready to look at. And I thought, in this interest, this, this goes back to about 68, 72, 73. And then, as I showed Denise, lo and behold, I turned this over. And here's a wonderful outline of vitamin D. <laughs> Even before I knew how wonderful it was, I, it was, there was something that was in there. And this peripheral brain was not quite enough. This is, is just a peripheral brain rheumatology subspecialty, peripheral brain. All these things looking through there, and uh, it's kind of fun to look back through those. And actually, I had legible handwriting then, which makes it very nice. So that's all I know. I want to open up for any questions at all about rheumatology stuff. And what I don't know, we're going to look up here at our peripheral brain and see what we've got. This is the other peripheral brain that's got little cards from different you know, journals that you look at and say, gosh, you know, let's take a look at this. What do you know? What, what questions have you got? Boy. Polymyalgia rheumatica. So if you've had it, how often does it uh, return? Not very often, but it, 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 if you're, you're related to a physician in the family, you have a greater chance it'll return for some reason. I mean, skinny, Aunt Skinny was the first person that I really knew that went from PMR to giant cell arteritis. Um, but presumably, you know, it could occur, you know, more often because there's that overlap, PMR, but, and, uh, and then we have also polymyalgia dramatica. You know, some, if we can be hurting so bad, you say, good golly. Get up in the morning, hours of stiffness, can't move, <laughs> and uh, dramatic response to the prednisone. So I think that's, that's unusual. But you know, the problem with you know, going to a talk like this is it puts, somehow puts it in your system. And if one of you is going to have pseudo gout or gout or headache in the next day or so, <laughs> don't blame me, just know what to do about it. Any other questions? Well, here's one. Let's, I start off, and, and this is my file. It's called Government Excess Bureaucracy. And it says that you'll be interested to know that 1960, the government employed 8.7 million folks. 2011, 22.5 million. The um, manufacturing had 15 million in 1960, 11.5 million in 2011. More and more government people working. Annette. Yeah, I was just going to ask another question about the polymyalgia in America. What actually causes that itself? Uh, is there some instigator that causes that to occur? I'm, I'm sure it is. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it is. I think it's, again, because it runs in families. Um, and, you know, we just look at these other things, saying infections obviously can uh, stimulates many of these inflammatory conditions. I still wonder about viral and infection, uh, but other things in our environment, we know now may trigger off some of these, these, these illnesses, uh, chemicals you get exposed to. I think those are most likely, but there's nothing that's definitely known about that as it is in some of these other conditions. 
like like the uh, the um, example of the, the patient with the Shigella dysentery, you know, hit the Navy ship, and you know, 200 of them got sick, but five or six of them developed long-standing arthritis, definitely triggered off by that infection. So I, I suspect the infection is the things we get exposed to, but our environment again, Agent Orange, has a trigger for several of my patients with lupus, and, and our environment's not getting any any friendlier, I don't think. So it is an autoimmune disease. I think it is. And if you had had cancer in your background and had chemotherapy, radiation, those kinds of drugs, could that be an instigator? I think so. I do. And, uh, and I can't, you know, can't say, you know, you know, they had so many patients who had those previous histories that one or the other particularly was, you know, was more likely to do it. Um, but I guess the best example is, you know, when it started treating a lot of the childhood leukemias with what they call CHOP therapy, cytoxan, hydroxyurea, oncovin, prednisone therapies, that a lot of them later on had increased chances of developing secondary cancers as adults. So, you know, when you sort of, you know, tweak the immune system, I've always worried about the biologic agents that are used so much in, in rheumatology because again, they're altering the, the immune system. You know, are they gonna be things that end up uh, having problems 20 or 30 years later? You know, and right now they're saying, well, COVID, you know, it's not that major thing in young kids. Wait till 20 or 30 years from now, and they're gonna look back and say, did you have COVID 20 years ago? So the people with COVID now don't have a lot to look forward to. They got a lot of itises to look forward to? Possibly. And to me, I mean, <clears throat> to me, that would be the reason to say, you know, maybe I don't, I don't like vaccinations. I don't, I don't you know, want to get my kids vaccinated. <clears throat> I would be thinking lot down, you know, way down the road. If, if these other illnesses kind of give us examples of, of how they may, they may act. What did you find with uh, PMR? I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. How, how did PMR affect you? I had the joints. My, my symptoms for um, this polymyalgia was joints were inflamed and it started at my ankles and went to my knees and then to my hips. And I was not able to walk. I mean, they were all swollen and red all at the same time. Um, and uh, nobody seemed to know what was wrong with me, except for you. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it, it's not evidently a, a common thing. Well, <clears throat> I think that it's one of the problems is a lot of the rheumatology diseases aren't common you know, as a primary care doc. Uh, <clears throat> and we tried, so we tried to get them interested like the alpha gal do the alpha-gal test, do the alpha-gal test. <clears throat> and I had another <clears throat> one of my church friends that called, concerned about one of her friends. And, and again, she'd been through all this workup. She's feeling terrible. Um, and and any, any tick disease, no, there's no tick disease. Let me see the lab work. And of course, they had not checked alpha-gal. It's not part of the tick panel. Don't know how long it'll take for people to realize that. So at the very onset of the Again, the polymyalgia pneumatica thing. What kind of test should be done? Should and that's a really good question because it should be the SED rate, number one. And if, if the person doesn't already have some underlying condition, tumor or something like that, then you'd be looking like PSA in the men. And usually a, a general blood test, um, chem screen, will pick up underlying liver problems, muscle problems that might be part of the presentation of things to exclude. But in, in general, the, the polymyalgia dramatic, the, the cleanest cut case of PMR would be, again, somebody that has no pre prior problems, wakes up in the morning, you know, feeling like he's 100 years old, and has a set rate that's over 50, gets on prednisone, it goes away in two or three weeks, and you taper them on down off over the next few years. But thing, things are usually not that clean anymore. <laughs> They're always complicating things. That's why we say IOMSIF. What are the different elements that are causing your aches and pains? Okay. 
that's kind of the way I did. I woke up one morning and I, my ankles were swollen and red. And I'm, I'm going, well, what did I do overnight? Uh, you know. And I, I, w I had a headache and I, you know, I would just, as you say, felt a hundred, had it a hundred, I felt like a hundred years old. So, you know, I knew I had to be doing something quickly. Um, it's probably been about 20 years ago, and I haven't had it since. I just had it the one episode, and they put me in the hospital and hit me hard with prednisone. Um, and I stayed in there for almost two weeks, running a temperature and the whole nine yards. But, um, once they got it gone, and I was on prednisone for, I know, a year. You know, it took me forever to get off of it. Yeah. I think it was 80 milligrams of uh, prednisone I was on a day or something. It was pretty high. But. Yeah. Well, you know, the, uh, sometimes the oncologist, you see even higher doses we do. <coughs> she was just part of our 20-year our guarantee that we, we have with our patients. That's very nice. <laughs> I've enjoyed the 20 years. Thank uh, you. For <laughs> enjoy 20 more. I was diagnosed with polymyalgia rheumatica about five years ago, but I was told it was from a very stressful event that I had, and then <coughs> put me on 15 milligrams of uh, prednisone. But the bad news is it took them almost a year to diagnose me. But I actually then, you know, tapered down as you <coughs> talked about, and. Um, I got completely off, and they were shocked that I got completely off the prednisone. Now, whether that was wise on my part or not, but I was damn determined, you know. And so, um, and that's been uh, probably four years ago. But uh, I have, you know, I've had, my symptoms were quite a bit different than yours. I, I had more arthritic from head to toe. Uh, and I kept thinking it was something ortho-wise. But anyway, blah, blah, blah. That was my story. <laughs> I have a like question. Was your rate elevated? I'm sorry? Was your sed rate elevated? Oh, yeah, big time. And they followed that. Yeah, and, and following up, <clears throat> you know, I get every time some of the PMR. Yeah, say after I skinny, I would always ask, you know, new headache, scalp tenderness, pain in your mouth, temporary loss of vision. Did you have any of that? Uh, headaches. Probably. I didn't have any of the mouth. Uh, Pain in your mouth, chewing your food, chewing claudication. No, I had none of that at all. It was just, oh, you know, I never knew where the pains were going to show up day to day, but it was from head to foot. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, just didn't know what, what to do. I just thought it was arthritis or something. Like that, yeah. Well, again, a nice clean case. <laughs> the patient wakes up and the main things are, are you know, proximal around shoulders and hips mainly. Um, but obviously, everybody has a, can have their own, own variety, so. I have a question. They did a panel, you know how they do these blood work panels at some point, I forgot even why they did it, not very long ago. It showed in my past I'd had Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but I never knew it. The, um, I, that's exactly the case that my, my friend at church called about one of her friends who I saw here last week. And, um, and, and she was told that she had, that she had been feeling bad. She had Rocky Mountain spotted fever and uh, because of the blood test. The blood test shows, looks at two things. One is IgG antibodies, IgM antibodies. And the IgG antibody means you had an old infection or an old exposure. May not have had an infection at all. May have just had an exposure and had a little reaction to it. But you didn't have Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And if the IgM is not elevated, and, and this poor girl had gotten like two courses of doxycycline and so on, and it told that was her problem. Of course, she's not feeling any better because she didn't have it. Um, and that's, that, that's you know, very, very common. Parvovirus, the other one that was, was that way, you know, parvovirus uh, you know, can, can in kids be that slap cheek appearance, one of the, the five er erythemas the kids get. And they get over it, you know, in a week or so. If it hits the parent, 
parent all of a sudden, you know, develops stuff looks more like lupus than lupus does. They'll have arthralgias, myalgias. Um, they'll have fluid in their joints. They'll have skin rash. They'll have positive blood tests for lupus. Very interesting. So you see how the, their immune system reacts. Um, it just, it just, it's hard to predict. But the, the same thing with parvo. Almost everybody has IgG parvo virus antibodies. Uh, but the IgM was the one that tells you, wait, this is acute. So I'm going to go take care of it in a couple, maybe a couple of weeks. You know, get get better with treatment. Um, so that that was that was that story. That story I heard far too often. And and Stanley, I did have my second um, patient that was admitted. We came to, to hear it, and, and part of the medical thing, you had to take unassigned patients, uh, and, and you know, rotate a day about every four or five weeks. You were on call for any patients came in the emergency room didn't have any, any a, a doctor. A lot of them from outside the, the uh, area um, never never came to the hospital. So the patients show up in the emergency room, we'd, we'd get those patients. Uh, and the first patient I got was a patient with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. It was a nurse's grandmother put in the hospital here. She did actually had it and had to do a spinal tap and all this stuff. I mean, it's a, you feel bad with it. It's not, it's not a subtle thing. Anyone else had any Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever? That was that was much more common even than Lyme disease when we first started here, but then but then later on Lyme disease. And where's Lyme disease going? It's, it's going to be it's going to be eclipsed by by Rocky Mountain or by Rocky Mountain by, by Alpha Gal. Yeah. I've had both. Well, I've had Lyme you're just you're special. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've had both. Yeah. The doxy cycle was with the with the Lyme. The um, I have insomnia, so I watch a lot of Fraser reruns. Anybody watch old Fraser? And one of them is Martin, the father, and he's talking to uh, the sons, Niles and Fraser, and and it said something like that. Well, you know the, uh, the teachers in school, you know, said you all you know, were so you know, so so strange, and he said, no, I told him you were special. You're special, <laughs> not strange. Okay, I've, I've got answers to every. Rheumatology question up here. Okay. That's all I know. Thank you.